Uh, last week, we, we looked at the, the man born lame sitting at the gate. And um, we looked at various um, representations of sitting at the gate. Uh, and of course, we, we, we narrated this to, to mean that sitting at the gate or sitting generally to mean a comfortable, docile, inert uh, position that one would find himself outside of the temple of God. Something that should ordinarily be a bother to a child of God when he finds himself outside of the gate, yet he's, you know, very comfortable in that place. So we, we, we now give um, different uh, narrations of what that would portend. So what we're going to do uh, today is basically to give it an application uh, rather than just a, a theological or theoretical uh, discussion that we had uh, last week. So we will look at sitting at the gate, the man, the man that was born lame, who was sitting at the gate, and use him as a reference for the church of God today. We use him as a reference for Christians generally who embody what we call the church of the living God. So we can say that for the most part, the church has been and is still in many instances sitting at the gate. What do we mean by that? For example, there are so many people in our churches who are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They are forever learning. They are coming to church. They attend Bible study, they attend faith clinic or prayer meetings, fastings, night vigils, and so on and so forth, but they are never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They remain in bondage, they remain in captivity. What is even sad is how we hold weekly and even monthly, or should we say regular deliverance services, regular miracle services, regular healing services, and it's the same people who come to those meetings. The same people, they are ever learning, never able to break out from what has kept them in bondage, never able to break free from those things that have kept them down. They, they come for healing services and they, 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 they claim that they've been healed only to, to find that there's a recurrence. We know from the scriptures in John chapter 8, verse 36, the Lord Jesus Christ said clearly, whom the son shall set free is free indeed. So, if indeed the Lord Jesus Christ is the one setting men free, then they should be free. So we don't understand what is going on. Why are we finding people who are sitting supposedly at the feet of Jesus, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of truth? We discussed this last week. Then we looked at another um, sitting position where we find people sitting idly. Instead of sitting in meditation on the word of God, they were sitting idly. And we looked at the example of Aaron. So we can apply that and say church leaders and in, in fact their congregants sit idly by. And they are being gingered by others, by the world, by unsanctified men, by people who, 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 um, what, what we'll say, people who will consider to be ignorant when it comes to spiritual things. They are propelling these idle leaders and idle members, idle Christians into action. Satan is, is, is of course, the, the overall head of this, of this uh, 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 motivation. And is motivating men and women who are supposedly Christians to go ahead and make gold calves. Gold calves describe the gods that we make for ourselves. The gods that are not almighty God, but they are convenient gods. They are gods that we're happy with. They are gods that we're excited about. They are gods that don't query us. They are gods that don't, don't challenge us in any way. They are gods that we can say, we want this, and they, they bring to us. So we end up doing those things. I mean, for example, it's, is it not strange that we find in many churches today that there are people who are still praying in the name of the God of pastor so-and-so? And we, we have to ask the question, what is wrong with simply saying in the name of Jesus Christ? Why must you say in the name of the God of Pastor so and so? Perhaps you know that God to be different from the God Almighty, from God Almighty, or to be different from the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know. Maybe there's something about, about the God of that pastor 
that is not the Lord Jesus Christ. And you prefer that God because that God allows you to be unholy, allows you to be unsanctified, allows you to do whatever it is that you want to do and you can get away with many things. That God of, of, of your pastor does not see what you do in secret. But Almighty God sees what you do in secret. He knows what is in your heart. Even before you think, the Bible says that he already knows. Afar off. And then I find a situation where people are turning to gods that they can control. They want God to do this for them now. Otherwise, they will leave him. As though Almighty God requires anything from us, we fail to realize that it is of his goodness that we are saved. It is of its goodness that we have not been discarded. It is because of the nature of Almighty God that we have these things. And then we now come around and see pastors engaging in idle works. Part of it is our church buildings. Some of them are involved in building personal empires. The Bible tells us about Solomon's building. It says in, in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 10. 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 10. I'm not going to read it. The Bible tells us that Solomon spent 20 years engaging in building projects. Seven years was actually what was expended, uh, that, that was spent building the temple of God. The other 13 years, he used in building his palace. So we have a situation where we have church leaders and church members who engage in building projects that have no bearing with God. And they spend so much time on those things. Time, energy, money, People are, pastors are preaching so much on money today, all because of these projects that they have gone to engage themselves in. These are gold cows. They are representative of gold cows. People who are sitting idly by, just like Aaron sat idly by, and the people of Israel came and gave him work to do. And he, he was quick to do it because he wanted the people around him. Then we spoke about sitting um, in the seat of, of the scornful. And we have churches, congregants, church leaders who are sitting in the seat of the scornful. In Second Peter, Second Peter chapter two, um, Second Peter chapter two, verse two, chapter two, verse one to three, the Bible says, "But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you." who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them and bring on themselves swift, destruct, swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. We have a situation where in our churches, what we now have are false teachers, false prophets, false pastors. And some of these gatherings are themselves false churches. We have people who are supposed Christians sitting in the seat of, of the scornful. In Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, from verse 17 to 19, Paul writes to Ross. He says, brethren... Join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is, the, is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. We have people like that. They, they, they have denied the cross. They have denied the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have denied the God that saved their souls and are doing other things. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, the Bible speaks of the people who are comparing themselves by themselves and not being wise doing that. We find churches, church pastors, comparing notes. They hear, the, they hear a message given by God to a pastor. They pick that message without recourse to whether they should preach it or not, and they go ahead to their churches and begin to preach it, as though it were doctrine. We've seen people pick doctrine from the Bible and give it their own interpretation and their own translation, and run with such a thing. 
What, 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 strange, what strange times we are living in. Then we spoke about comedians. Comedians in the church. Comedians in the pulpit. These people come and, and we, we for, for some reason, we get excited about it. When announcement is made that a particular comedian is coming, everybody is in uproar, clapping and excited. This is the seat of discomfort. And then we, 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 have, we have gotten to the place where the church, in the church of God, entertainment is the main thing. You go for some night vigils because they don't want people to sleep. They come up with all kinds of programs, all kinds of activities, just so that you don't sleep. And it's not as if you are doing anything. Sometimes some of these things can be tiring and tiresome. Because it's not even to God. It's just for ourselves. We go for these programs and all we are doing is praying for ourselves, ourselves from morning till night. What is God's prayer concern? We're not interested. What does God want the church to pray for? We're not interested. What is it that God wants the church to focus on? We're not interested. Then we spoke about church uh, people who sit on the fence. There are many churches that are sitting on the fence right now. And what do we mean by that? They are not taking a stand for God. Unlike Elijah. Elijah took a stand for God. He went before Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 1. He said, as the Lord, as, as the Lord who has sent me uh, uh, lives, there will be no rain until I say so. And it was so. Three and a half years, no rain. Until God told him to go and appear that he's ready to bring down rain now. And when he went to the people, he said to the people, why do you hold between two opinions? If God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve Baal. Stop jumping around the place. Stay in one place. Take a stand. And the same Elijah, when, 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 when uh, what's her name? Jezebel came after him. He fled. But at least he took a stand. Like somebody said, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. He fled. But when he fled, God met him. God comforted him, strengthened him, and sent him back. And nobody could stand against him. But we must be taking a stand for God. Then there are those who are not standing on the side of God. We're not just taking a stand for God. But on what side are you? We have said earlier that if you say that you are for God, then you will support everything he supports. There are two sides. There's the side of God and there are the sides of others. It's either you're on the side of God or you're on the side of others. You can't pick and choose. You can't be on the side of God today and the side of others tomorrow. No, you must, you must stay on one side. Today we find churches engaging themselves in political discourse. It's not as bad as it may sound. However, the problem we are having is that they are not speaking from the throne of God. They are speaking from their flesh. They are speaking from how it concerns them. They don't know what God is saying. Sometimes God wants somebody to just be the head, to be the president. It doesn't have to be a Christian. I mean, for example, if you, if you live in a country that is secular in nature, where you, you cannot say this is, a, this is a, 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 a Christian or Muslim nation, then God would have to appoint sometimes a non-Christian as, as, as the head of state or head of government, as the case may be. Why do we always think that it must always be a Christian for God to do things? We have found people who claim to be Christian, who are heads of government, who are worse than infidels in the way they conduct themselves, who are an embarrassment to the Christian faith, an embarrassment to Almighty God. They have blasphemed. They've caused the name of God to be blasphemed amongst the heathen. All because the church is not standing with God. We will not tell those people that we support their program because their programs align with ours. We will not tell them to their faces that what they are doing is wrong. We will be supporting them discreetly, tacitly, making statements in the churches that have no bearing on... Um, the, the statements we are making, they have no bearing on doctrinal issues. They have bearings only on what uh, people want to, people think that this is the, this is the ingoing social discussion at this point in time. 
Then we, we, we looked at, um, when we talk of not standing on the side of God, we saw how when the Lord Jesus Christ uh, approached Joshua, how, how, um, how Joshua um, said to, to him, he said, are you for us or are you for the enemy? And he said, neither. In other words, God is not for anybody. The question is, on which side are you? And that's all that God, are you on my side? When Moses went into that camp in Exodus chapter 32, verse 26 to 29, he said, whoever is on the side of God, come to me. The children of Levi came and he told them, go in now and start killing all those. These were people with whom they had worshipped the gold calf. He said, go in now and kill those people. It, it takes being on the side of God to do the will of God. If you are not on the side, you cannot do the will of God. And as a result of their action, God was able to get them as his very own. That was how the Levites came to become the people whom God now used in the, in the, in the service of the tabernacle. Because they stood with him. They stood by him. They stood with him. They stood on his side when every other person had chosen their own way. According to Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 to 17 or thereabout, we, we read about the, the Laodicean church. This was a church. Let, let me just read the, the, that, that, those verses of scripture there. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3. From verse um, 15. Yes, 15 to 17 says, I know your works. That you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. He was speaking to a church here. And he said to them, You, you guys think that you have everything, you think you have money. You think you have um, renown. You think you have top government officials in your congregation. You don't know that you are, you, are, you are miserable, that you are wretched, that you are poor, that you are blind, and that you are naked. The church of God presently is in a sitting position, sadly, at the gate, outside the temple. And it doesn't seem to face them. We spoke about how people get to sit at the gate, by choice or by force. Those who are sitting at the gate by choice, by choice are those who made up their minds and decided that they are going to follow men. They decided and made men their mentors. They said, this is my, this is my spiritual father. God did not tell them to go to those men. They chose and said, this is my spiritual father. And whatever he says is what I will do. It's by choice. They have now sit, they are now sitting at the, at the gate. They are not in the temple. They are not serving God. Even though they claim to be serving God, but they are not serving Him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, I believe Paul, that's where Paul said, Be ye followers of me, or be ye imitators of me, even as I follow or as I imitate Christ. What he's saying there is that you will follow these people insofar as they are following Christ. The minute they cease from following Christ, we stop following them. We must understand by implication, therefore, that we must know how Christ walks, how he would want us to walk. So yes, we can have spiritual leaders that would follow, but we follow them insofar as they are following Christ. It is incumbent, therefore, on us to know what the Lord is saying. We cannot leave what the Lord is saying in the hands of men. Because the Bible says, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So it's not every time that they will speak exactly what God wants them to say. Sometimes they could embellish it. At other times they could give it their own interpretation. Not because they are, they are, they are being malicious. No, it's just human nature. So it is incumbent that we know what the Lord is saying. There's nothing wrong in seeking the face of God, even before you go for a church meeting, to find out what the Lord is going to tell you in that meeting. 
and you can you can relate it. Then there are those who are who who are sitting where they are by force. They have no choice in the matter. They are under under bondage to sin, under bondage to fame, under bondage to money, under bondage to lust, and they just find themselves powerless, unable to do those things. Then we now spoke about the grace of God that comes to deal with these things. How where sin abounded, the grace of God abounded much more. 